like to call to order the July 20th regular meeting of the Forever School Committee. Deb, would you please call the roll? Mr. Agia? Here. Mr. Costa? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Mr. Hetzel? Here. Mr. Corey? Here. Ms. Larrabee? Here. Mayor Coogan? Here. A salute to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have nobody joining us tonight by Zoom, and pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed to be acknowledged and permissible. Uh, citizens input. Do we have any citizens input tonight? We do, we have two letters from um, two schools. Uh, Deb, would you please read the citizens input? Sure, the first one is from the Doran School. Dear school committee members, please accept this letter on behalf of a group of educators from the John J. Doran Community School. We are passionate about teaching and working in the Fall River Public Schools. We also believe it is imperative that you are made aware of how the loss of ELT impacts our school and our students. The concerns and comments outlined below are a consensus resulting from both meaningful conversations and purposeful reflection. First, we wanna thank, thank you for your leadership during these challenging times. We understand that COVID-19 has led to a serious economic crisis. We recognize, we recognize, you, have, we recognize you have been in an inevitable position of making very difficult decisions. We want to express what a special place Doran is and how the extended learning time has direct, directly correct, oh my God, correlated to the success of a community school. We currently utilize this time for strategically planned academic support for all of our students in our pre-K learning environment. That additional half hour is based to provide targeted instruction to all students based on MCAS assessment data, IEP objectives, and ELL language goals. We meet after every 10-week teaching cycle to review formative data from small group instruction. Based on that data, we adjust student groups and academic target goals. Due to, due to the meaningful planning and instruction, our school has experienced great success with students meeting exceeding expectations most notably with our MCAS data. Since 2012 with the ELT, our school percentile over time has grown from 9% to 40% in 2016. We continued that growth with MCAS 2.0 as we went from 27% in 2018, 2018 to 31% in 2019. The results are clear. Our intervention time is efficient, effective, and proven to be invaluable to our students and their learning. This time is also crucial when providing services for our ELL and special education population. There are a number of students who either are level one, two, who are supposed to receive two and a half hours a day of language instruction. Many students have specific pullout services outlined in their IEPs for essential targeted instruction outside the core. This half hour is critical in being able to provide those services. Our intervention blocks do more than prove our academics. It also provides time for building teacher-student relationships. We are proud of the fact that we have developed a family-like community at our school, and that does not happen by chance. We have teachers and students who want to be in school as demonstrated in our high teacher retention and low chronic aptitude aptism um, rate. Our teacher retention rate is 90.24% for which 2018 and 2019 school year. Additionally, our chronic absenteeism was a mere 13.2% which exceeded the target and met the chronic absenteeism rate of 90% for all students statewide. We have teachers and students who want to be in school together made evident by our data. We recognize 
the erroneous situation that we are all in right now, and we are not advocating to trade a loss of staff for the additional instruction time. We know our system works and we want what our kids deserve. We would like ELT restored as soon as possible. Our students need ELT now more than ever. Sincerely, a group concerned, John J. Doran Community School Teachers. The other letter is from the Vivera School. Dear school committee members, please accept this letter on behalf of the educators at the Charlton M. Vivera Elementary School as a team that is dedicated to teaching in the Fall River Public Schools. We believe it is important to explain how the loss of ELT impacts our school and our students. The concerns and comments outlined in this letter are the result of thoughtful conversation and reflection amongst teachers, classroom teachers, instructional <coughs> coaches, special educators, teacher leaders, and specialist teachers ranging from one year to 10 years experience at the school. First, we want to thank you for your leadership during these challenging times. We understand that the current pandemic has led to a serious economic crisis and there is no doubt you've been in the position of making difficult decisions. We want to highlight that after more than 10 years at, of ELT at Viveris, the additional time has become deeply ingrained in the culture of our building. It is hard for us as educators to imagine our days ahead without it and are deeply concerned with the impact it will have on our teaching and on the academic outcomes of our students. When reflecting on how we use the ELT time, we reflected on its impact on student learning, teaching, and overall scheduling. In the attached documents, we highlight some of the ways we have used ELT time to enhance not only the learning of our students, but the development of our staff members. Although many of the things mentioned in the attachment are things that are true in all schools in Fall River. We strongly feel that the extended time at Bavaris has allowed us to do these things more deeply and consistently. As you read the summary we've developed, we also encourage you to reach out to our team to expand on any of the points raised. With all the student benefits of ELT, we also must share, all the, must share that the decision to cut ELT will have a great financial impact on the Viveris educators next year. It also highlights some disappointing facts about our base compensation. It is clear that a 17 to 30% decrease in earnings is devastating. However, it is also disheartening to mention that the base compensation to do the great work that Viveris educators do is not comparable to nearby districts, including New Bedford, Attleboro, and Taunton. When comparing educator step and lane positions on the salary scale for school year 2020, the median percent difference on the base salary schedule was 16% below Attleboro and 11% below New Bedford and Taunton. In Taunton, the top step with master's degree is 20% greater than Fall River. For years, educators at Viveris have been dedicated to work 90 extra minutes a day in order to have matching compensation and competitive wages. It is clear that the elimination of this time will heavily impact our educators financially. We do understand that the decision to cut ELT at this time was one that needed to be made. We also understand that the current state we also understand that the current state of the country and Commonwealth may not lend to the best time to address the compensation issues that have grown over that past 10 plus years. However, we feel there is a need to acknowledge these issues and collaborate on ways to address them in our work ahead. We hope that you are able to help us to continue to create some of these opportunities for our students in the 2021 school year and beyond. If possible, with safety restrictions, we also hope that funding can be made available to provide extracurricular and enrichment activities in our school to compensate for the learning time lost with a cut to ELT. And it's respectfully the <coughs> educators of Viveris. And it lists the team and uh, leaders. Thank you, Deb. Um, we have no recognition awards tonight. Item three. Item four, the superintendent's report by Dr. Matthew Malone. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, hosting this meeting tonight. 
colleagues on the school committee, I'm going to speak about four things. The first is the uh, inclusion in the binder for the committee's review of the uh, remote learning report that I promised the uh, committee that we would share. Now, the bottom line is uh, this was a learning experience for us. Um, we did not engage at the levels uh, that we would have liked, uh, which is about in line with uh, the rest of the communities in the Commonwealth, uh, and where you have a plan in place, which is the next item uh, on the agenda for the continued refinement of uh, the Fall River Flex uh, Learning Academy, which will be a much different platform and allow us uh, many more uh, tools in our toolbox to be able to engage students. Uh, one of the key pieces of the, uh, of the report, and you'll see the analysis in it, uh, we did some survey data and we also interviewed and then we looked at some quantitative figures as well in terms of uh, usage percentages. Um, the rollout, one of the things that's unique, the rollout of the remote learning. Remember, when we originally shut down, we were only shut down for two weeks, and then it was another two weeks, and then it was another two weeks. One of the things that we learned was expectations uh, during that time weren't as clear as we would have liked, and that's, that's no one's fault here at this table uh, or anyone in the school system. Um, but it's the expectations that came down. We thought we were going to have a short-term closure, and then we'd be right back at it. But that didn't happen. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've learned is the expectations around what students will know and be able to, what adults uh, must do in order to engage students. Those expectations uh, we roll out in the fall uh, will be uh, much different uh, uh, in the future. So that's a big takeaway for us. Uh, I'm proud of the, uh, of the efforts that were put in to making uh, uh, this report, particularly Dr. Curley did a great job with their analyses. Uh, are there any questions on this specific uh, report? Okay. Go ahead. On this, whole, question? On on this part? Thing? The first nope, part. Just on the remote learning. The okay. remote part, the first part. Yeah, this binder, right? No. Okay, I know questions. I am for later. I didn't That's want to miss right. the okay. boat. I thought that was a little short of a presentation if that was the case. No. Yeah, no, this is, this is just to talk about the remote learning report that's in the binders uh, under the uh, superintendent's report. I do have one question on that. So the data for each school, I, when I looked at it, it looked like it was more from a top level. Do we have any individual school data on how many, like, uh, for instance, in school A, they have 500 students. How many students in each particular, what is the data for each school? Yeah, I did, we it, have by that that we could get? I did it by level because it's harder to get um, because a lot of this data that came back again was through surveys, so we did it, we mastered it by level. In terms of the usage, uh, it skews. Um, I yeah, I'd like to just personally ask for whatever information. So we have however many schools. I was curious to see how much how successful was each school in doing what type of instruction? When, you, when I looked at some of the data, it, it indicated uh, a wide variance of you know, expectations. Some were more than others, and there was nothing to back that info up right. when well, I looked at it. That's what we were real clear about, is that the array of expectations is a problem for us. So to have one clear, consistent expectations. And don't forget, the remote learning was not Uh, one uh, modality. There was, there was synchronous instruction, there was check-ins, and then there was online learning in terms of the use of uh, programs out of distance, like programs like that we buy, like Edgenuity or iReady or things. But then there was also, in our model, um, <clears throat> students that didn't have connectivity and others chose the paper route, and that was what we did, we photocopied large amounts of student work. So if I did a report as to who used what, I don't know if it would give you the information you're looking for because the numbers of students, like connectivity would determine what the answer is. Does that make sense? And we and we were able to say how much connectivity we had. But I mean, if you say to me, how many kids use remote learning in each school? And I said to you, well, Everyone did something remote learning, whether it be paper yep. or computer. Maybe I can just clarify. What I'm looking for is 
we've received no information, and I'm not being critical of this, it's just something to learn from, from each school on how um, <coughs> their school handled the entire remote learning process. So maybe a one-pager from each principal to say, oh. here's what worked well, here's what didn't work yeah, well. Yeah, I have all the information, I amassed it, so I've given you the executive summary. Yep. That's what you have. Right, so we can't get in information. I'm, I'm from, giving from you the school. executive summary. I, mean, I, could, I, I don't know what specifically. I don't think that's a, too much of an ask. Maybe, it's, maybe I'm the but, only one, well, but I my thing it would be if, if I, as a member of the committee, would ask for a one-page document summarizing the positives and negatives of remote learning at each school. I've given you I don't you think that. that's. I've given you that. As a whole? Yes. I'm talking about individually. Well, I don't I think don't, that's too much to ask. I don't know why I would do that, and we're busy with other work right now. I would figure that would be something that would be valuable to any school committee member to, to see. But maybe I'm the only one. I yield. Anything further? Go ahead, Doctor. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda, which leads to Mr. Aguirre's point. The Flex Learning Academy, which is the... the, the uh, the tool that we're developing now, the, the platform. Frank and his team are working very uh, uh, diligently on the architecture. We have a whole other group of learning and teaching folks working on the content with our outside partners and our uh, programs that we have. So we've given you our overarching report as to where we are. Frank and the team uh, right now are working on uh, the development of this tool. We know that no matter what we have in place next year for a learning model, remote learning will be one of them that's weaved throughout any uh, posture that we take. And the reason being is we know that there will be students who cannot or will not return to school either because of their own choice or their parents' choice and we've been told by the state we still must engage. So we are developing this tool, which we're calling Flex Academy, because of its flexibility, to be able to offer a one-stop shop of learning experiences, uh, pre-K through 12, plus credit recovery, uh, for all of our students. And this will be um, synchronous with all of the other uh, work that we're doing around reopening, which I'll explain later, but. What we decided to do, and this is where we had a discussion with, I remember uh, Vice Chair Costa was vocal about this uh, meeting a couple months ago, uh, that we're doing this ourselves, our own team. Is, you know, there's a cost, there's definitely a cost. Uh, we budgeted, and you approved, uh, $200,000 from uh, the CARES Act money uh, for the technical assistance and any other time, uh, devices, et cetera, that we need to uh, develop the, uh, the remote learning so we're working on that now. Now, we get this right and it's, we do this well, we'll be able to, no matter what the scenario, we'll be able to operate a true remote learning platform. Whether it's a snow day, no longer will we need to do snow days if we can just go to, everyone goes to follow reflex on a day where we have inclement weather, but also if the COVID-19 uh, spikes and we have to, re, we have to shut down the the, the state or the, di the district or the state again uh, would be able to go 100% remote learning with this platform at a much better model than what we just discussed in terms of usage. The expectations will be clear, the usage will be uh, consistent across buildings, and we'd be able to have a, a, a much better model. So this entire uh, platform is being designed with lessons learned from the original uh, remote learning experience that we had from March through June. So this is an update. I'll have more information uh, on Fall River Flex for you uh, in August. Uh, and I want to thank uh, everyone that's been working so hard on getting that off the ground. I, I got one comment. It kind of it kind of piggybacks on what um, Kevin asked you. I'm not really. I mean school by school with the way that rolled out two weeks and then another two when we were getting dragged along. But I would think when we go to this, this platform that you should be able to give us something closer to updates regularly because again of the advance so that we know the schools that are struggling. Daily or weekly. Okay. And we, I mean, the metrics on this are going to be tight. We're going to be able to control who's doing what in terms of uh, daily 
usage reports and tracking, uh, and also the expectations around what we're actually saying students must do every single day. Right. We're going to get much more sophisticated in that. And we can get that. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes, and it would actually tell you a story. It would mean something. Okay. Thanks, Doc. Anything further? I got two more items. Yep. Graduation. All right. Tomorrow is the uh, Fall River Public Schools graduation in the morning, 10 o'clock, RPA, and then at uh, 6 o'clock uh, uh, is Durfee High School, both uh, on the football field, outdoors at Durfee. We're very excited. Uh, graduation will follow all the um, state guidelines in terms of spacing and those things. I know there's some parents upset that and families that they couldn't get more tickets than, than we allow, but that's all we can allow and that's all that we can provide in the gathering under the guidance. So I'm sorry, but that is what it is and we are following <coughs> the guidance. Uh, school committee, uh, 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 in terms of roles this year, we won't be shaking hands, we'll be following uh, all the guidelines, but everyone will be uh, on the stage, will be in mass uh, dress coolly and, uh, and we look forward to uh, 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 a nice graduation ceremony. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I'm gonna be sweating like crazy, but I'm not. No, I just. A, I, are you wearing that costume? When no. you said dress coolly, I didn't mean if we have to wear plaid pants. These are called my new chats. Okay. You zip this down. I'll dig them out. <laughs> I know you got a pair. These are the coolest <laughs> things I got. I should have dressed casually, coolly. But yeah. I can't. Go ahead, you right. I'm going to end up, I'll have to be in a tie again, but I am not wearing the, uh, costume. Yeah. what do we call it, the Renaissance Fair, the King Richard's Fair costume, although I bought the damn thing to be able to wear it once a year. All right, final thing under the, under the updates is the capital projects that are ongoing. Mm. Aside from everything else we're doing, we, we do need to, to recognize Ken uh, and his team in the city's partnership uh, on the uh, state projects that we have ongoing at RPA, Watson and Stone, window, windows, roofs, <coughs> boilers. It's uh, being done in phases. If you've driven by those three schools, you see the extent of the construction. I know that uh, a couple of you asked to go see a couple of buildings. Just let me know when you're free. I know uh, Tom wants to go see Watson. Uh, it's great work that's happening there. We'll have windows that open uh, and new <coughs> boilers and, and uh, air control systems. And really, the good news is it is all connected to what we're also doing uh, uh, with all of our uh, pandemic preparations as well. So those projects are ongoing. State funding with city uh, 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 matching and support. We want to thank the city for their efforts to get those three buildings uh, uh, ready to go uh, for <coughs> next year. With that, uh, that ends my uh, superintendent's report tonight. Next item up, number six. I have three sets of minutes for approval. I'm looking for a motion and a second on motion. the special meeting 527. Motion made. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, Deb, please. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Haar? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. Next item up, regular school committee meeting on June 8th. I'm looking for a motion and a second. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Roll call, Deb, please. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. And finally, uh, the special meeting on June 24th. I'm looking for a motion and a second. Motion, motion okay. made. Any discussion on June 24th? A roll call, Deb, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Um, we have no travel requests tonight, so we'll move directly to uh, item number eight, acceptance of donations. Superintendent Malone. <clears throat> From Project Lead the Way to Morton Middle School, $4,000. From Rexel Energy Solutions to Morton Middle School, $2,000. From Stop and Shop A Plus Rewards to Durfee High School, $896.67. <coughs> From Project Lead the Way to Cuss Middle School, $687.50. From Durfee, school, Durfee Sports Boosters to Durfee Athletics, $490 to purchase plaques for the boys, girls basketball, boys, girls swimming, wrestling, women's cheer, 
boys and girls indoor track and field, cross country, fall chair, ice hockey, and athlete of the year. Motion to accept all donations. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, Deb. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Item number nine, approval of contracts. Um, I will take them as a lump sum unless somebody has any they want to pull out. I'm looking for a motion and a Motion second. to approve contracts. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call, Deb, just, please. Just oh, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Costa. Just a quick question. I believe it's the software that we've continued to use, but um, for the maintenance department, if I can just ask the superintendent that Dude Solutions, is that formerly Cool Dude or School Dude? We put it in the inventory, tracks maintenance schedule in terms of annual maintenance purchase uh, requests from schools. Okay, thank you, I yield. Anything further on contracts? Roll call, Deb, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Har? Yes. Mr. Hetza? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Um, item number 10, approval of grants. We have a number of grants. Does anyone have any concerns about any of the grants? Motion to approve grants. Second. We I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Deb, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Har? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Item number 11. Presentation and discussion, the draft plan for school reopening in the fall as presented by Dr. Matthew Malone, sec, sec, uh, superintendent of schools. So um, I'm gonna have a conversation with the committee at this time uh, that is not a PowerPoint. Uh, and the reason why I chose not to do a PowerPoint was I wanted to um, have a discussion that's more organic. Tonight is a first discussion around what, what we're calling a initial dynamic planning document for discussion with the school committee on uh, a reopening plan. As you know, uh, we are tasked uh, with developing a school reopening plan uh, that, uh, of course, uh, is, comes through the vetting of the school committee, uh, but is one that fully engages a host of uh, uh, folks in the process around the reopening of schools with a direction of ensuring that we have plans for three scenarios. Full, face-to-face, 100% -face, uh, in-school learning. Two, they know it. remote learning. And then three, some sort of uh, a hybrid model. Uh, we've been asked to have those three scenarios uh, submitted to the uh, state through their portal by July 31st. The state's asked for final plans uh, by August 10th. I've told the state that we won't have our final plans done by then as we're, uh, we don't have a school committee meeting until August 10th. Uh, so we will be uh, doing the work that we do to get to uh, a final plan, but we also have to understand and the public needs to understand and everyone needs to understand that everything is subject to change right now. Every day there's a new development with COVID-19. Every day there's new guidance released from the state. Every day. Just today we had new guidance released on what happens if a, uh, a child is sick or an adult is sick uh, during the day. New guidance that was just released today. I have that and it's in your, your uh, planning uh, binder for tonight, but that's the reality that we're living in. You have to understand the superintendents and union presidents uh, and, and, and building principals, uh, everyone has been inundated with constantly changing plans. This is the most unwieldy uh, process in the history, uh, modern history, the history of since I've been alive, understanding uh, uh, what, what we're going through. So this is unique. And I want to be clear with everyone that as we talk about planning, we're not talking about set in stone. What we're talking about is dynamic that can change. And I just want to, it's a very different way of thinking about things. And it's uncomfortable because all of us want to make a plan 
walk away from it, and it gets done. But that's not the world we're living in right now. Safety drives everything. So having said that, I know in, you saw me walk in with a box, so you understand, like, we were up until the last minute before this meeting getting this all together for you. So I know this is the first time you're seeing it. It's the first time that anyone is hearing it. And I want to, be, I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Costa and, and the Mayor Coogan for uh, giving me some counsel earlier. Uh, you know, everyone in the news wants to talk to me about the what ifs, and I've stayed radio silent. And I think that's a good thing. Because right now, this is the first time anyone uh, will get to hear uh, what some of our thinking is, and you will be the first people uh, to engage in that process. And from here, this then becomes public. So I'm very happy that tonight we'll get on the, we'll get on the board, if you will. We're on the field now. We're on the field with some talk about what reopening will look like. So let's make some, some non-negotiables. What's non-negotiable is that learning and teaching in Massachusetts will start again. Uh, in the first week of September. That, that's happening. The how is what we don't know. None of us know. <clears throat> now, we know what we've been asked to do. And tonight, I'm going to present to you some thinking around that. But again, I can't be as concrete to say, well, this is it. Let's just all do it. So with that, I'm going to make some comments tonight. And I'm really proud. I want to thank, before we even start, members of my team for putting this together. This is the most uh, concise uh, planning document that I've ever been part of, uh, and we've put it together in such a short period of time. And every community in the Commonwealth right now is, is going through this, <clears throat> working on these types of plans. So what I have before you is a planning binder that starts with what I'm about to present, which is the reopening plan. Then the task force, the reopening task force members the Flex Academy Task Force members, the Community Advisory Group Council members. Then we have all of the feedback from the task force recommendations. The re that we've asked them to give us recommendations. So we have who was on the, on the planning team and what are their recommendations. I'm going to come back to these in a minute. Then we have under the appendices, we have all of the documents of guidance and then safety guidance from CDC and, and, and from the state as to what we need to have in place in order to open. So this is everything, you know every single thing that I, that I know at this time uh, regarding uh, reopening. You have all the documents. Yes, it's like drinking water through a fire hose. It's a ton of stuff at once. But at least we have it all and we have it all on the table. So if you go with me to the first page that simply looks like this, it has Miss Mueller from the Green School. Uh, she, she knows that I put her picture, but I just love this photo. Uh, she's one of my favorite teachers in the system. Uh, visit her classroom quite a bit at Green. I'm always impressed with the work they're doing, but I like this photo because these kids are engaged. And you look at her teaching and she's engaged. And what this plan is all about is how do we get back to that? If that's the ideal, which to me it is, it's the epitome of this work that we call schooling that we do in Fall River. How do we get back to that where we have kids in front of us and we're working safely and we're happy and, and, and uh, all is well? In order to get to that photo, there is a lot of things we must do. So if you turn the page, the first page is a letter from me to you. Uh, and that letter explains how this is a, a new norm for us. And I actually quoted uh, Machiavelli about the introduction of a new order of things, and how that's the hardest uh, possible thing to do in the world, and it is, is to do, think of and introduce a new way of schooling. And really, that's what we're doing. Uh, so I introduce the document and frame it, and this is, again, a letter from me to you. The next page is the context. Why are we doing this? This is the direction from the state, and it gives us the specifics as to how we need to upload plans and be prepared to talk to the state about them. Then I've given something new. This is something I learned this year uh, reading a book during COVID uh, by uh, General Myatt, and, and that's about the intent. So when you're in a position of leadership, you always need to say, what's your intent? So people know from the top to the bottom, what are you trying to do? So I've, I've put out the intent here, this what I call the superintend superintendent's intent. How do we get to a place where we have 100% uh, schooling that's done in a way that's thoughtful 
and provide for safety of faculty and students at all times as, as the driver of what it is that we do. Then we talk about our planning, and that's on page three, and we articulate that. And then we have a timeline on page four, which says, you know, here we are tonight on July 20th, and presenting a draft plan to the committee. We then talk about our scenario plannings and how we have to prepare for scenario planning. So one of the things that we had to do was pressure test, do we have space to meet 100% uh, face-to-face instruction using a three-foot distance model? And we used um, a, a, a tool developed by the department, but the tool is flawed because it's based on square footage only. It doesn't take in account the nuances of, of rooms with some bookshelves and, and those types of things. So if you look at using just the tool and using all of our spaces, I'm talking library, art rooms, cafeterias, gyms, using all of our spaces, we could fit 100% of our students into our schools at three foot distance. We could do that. But that would require using all of our spaces and most likely require repurposing positions in order to have all of our students at three feet with the certified teacher in front of them. We then looked at, well, we don't believe that. So what do we do? Ken and his team go out in the field with principals and actually set up classrooms at both three foot distancing and six foot distancing. So here's what we know. CDC says, Use six feet. We hear six feet everywhere we go. Got to be six foot. We're six foot right now. I wish I was six foot, but I'm only five three. But for the sake of this argument, we're all six feet. All right. So we're at six foot across the Commonwealth in terms of everything we're doing across the country. But the guidance that came out said it's safe to go to three feet. So we used the three foot model. But we also knew. Wait a second. CDC says six feet. Everyone and we're talking to says six feet. That's something we gotta really think about. So we went and looked. If you turn the page, I'll give you two pictures. The first one's a picture of green, what three foot separation with traditional desks looks like. Second photo is at Fonseca School, what six foot separation looks like with regular desks. When we, when we went in and did three foot separation with regular desks in classrooms that we have 26 or 27 students, we were only able to get 22 in. At six feet, we're able to get somewhere around 17 to 19. In some cases, 20, if we're using um, longer tables. But you can see that we can't fit all of our students at six foot separation. But we can't also fit them in reality at three feet. I just want to be clear about it. Everyone say, oh, just go 100%, go to three feet, and you can fit everyone. Mathematically, you can't, but in reality, or mathematically, you can based on square footage of buildings, but not when you actually measure each classroom. So we've given you all of this data. We've given you, uh, or we put in the presentation, the uh, rubrics that, from the state, and we've added uh, our own opinion here uh, that although the matrix says one thing, through our actual, thank Ken and his team, actual measuring and placing desks, we know what our reality is. So we have some schools that can do it, but others that can't. And it's funny, the, the newer schools uh, um, have some of the uh, limitations, uh, like uh, Viveris, um, you know, but some of our older buildings were able to get close uh, at, at, uh, at uh, three feet uh, to the uh, class size. So with that, I wanna show, and we've been very, very purposeful in pressure testing, you know, we're, we're not talking the talk, we're out walking the walk in this, all right? I want to be real clear with folks about that. So on, if you're on page seven now, on page seven now we get into the, okay, we've done our pressure testing around space, but what do we have to look at? Well, we have a full 100% model, we got a hybrid model, and we have a remote learning model. We have to write plans for each of the three, three scenarios. So we did that. Now, these plans are not intensely in depth, it just tells you what we're gonna do. But what we've done is we've given them the pros and the cons for each scenario. 
So starting on page seven, we say, okay, if we're gonna do full 100% in person, it would require us at three feet using every single room that we have. Uh, and I've given four pros and four, four cons for each one. We did the same thing with the hybrid learning model. And then we did the same thing with the remote learning model, with the pros and the cons. We know that when we have to upload these three plans to the state, it's about a seven page long document and it's, uh, it's a, a template. We know that what we've written here would be able to uh, extrapolate and meet the needs of the state in those models. But they, again, those aren't specifics. It's just the general, can you do it or can't you do it? And our answer is, yeah, we could do three feet, but it would require X, Y, and Z. And what I'm about to get into is the real problem with three feet. If we had to do three feet, there's no way that we could fund the busing that would accompany that. So that starts on page 10. We did a huge analysis of transportation, both at three feet and six feet of, of spacing. It's not the six feet spacing on buses, because we, we would go to three foot spacing on buses. That's one kid per seat. <clears throat> the problem uh, with trying to jam everyone in and why it would cost much, if we went with 100% of the kids in in-person learning and 100% of the kids then having to get transported, we're looking at our transportation budget going up by about another $6.5 million, which is about 66% of the overall cost of transportation. $6.5 million on top of the upwards of 11 that we currently have in, in, in transportation. So that's a cost prohibitive problem for us. We are a transportation rich district, meaning we transport uh, many, many students. And you can see on page 13, um, I'm sorry, page 10 is our analysis. And on page 11, we give you uh, the models around three and six, and we show what a full bus looks like, uh, able to carry three kids per seat, 71 students, and then what it looks like uh, in the uh, three, th three foot model, the 24 students, and the six foot model, the whole bus could only carry 12 kids. Now, I wanna thank Worcester Public Schools uh, for their presentation because we, we took their uh, graphics here and cut those in. And uh, I want to thank Frank for uh, helping me do that today. Superintendents are sharing. I do give credit to Worcester on page uh, 11 there. If you go to page 12, we then start talking about food service, what it means for us at food service. How can food service uh, be effective in this new environment uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we were, or, or how we open schools? Now, granted, we gave out 356,000 meals uh, during closure, we could do that again. But we also know our team could do um, uh, in-person feeding uh, or grab and go or breakfast in the classroom, whatever models that we have in place, uh, we've analyzed food service and we know we'll be able to uh, deliver. And we looked at building sanitation. A sanit this, this, wait, I, I can't pronounce this, I, sanitization. So the deep cleaning and sanitizing of buildings. And we articulate the regular routines and then the, the you know, daily routines and the sp specialized deep routines that we need. Uh, and we talk about what those mean uh, uh, that we thought through as we're about to make a proposal for reopening. Then we get into page 13, the, the very uh, technical stuff around HVAC. This is a big deal. I thank the MTA and our local FREA for being on top of always, not just this year, but you know, the last 15 years, air, control, air quality issues in buildings uh, and what that means for us. So in our model, when we look at how we're gonna maintain air, one of the unique things is the changing of filters twice a year. Uh, we'll use 9,000 filters next year uh, <coughs> across the Florida Public Schools. That's an amazing stat because we have 3,000, we're gonna change them out twice, three, six, nine. Uh, so pretty cool to think about how much uh, is going on there with that. And then finally on page 14, uh, we have the capital specific projects for COVID-19. That's the uh, plexiglass systems that we're putting up and glass systems in our main offices uh, and other uh, things that we'll be doing. So now if you get to page 15, so what, are, what am I talking about? What am I proposing as a path forward? So what I'm proposing to the school committee for school year 2021 uh, is that we open 
for Learning on September 1, that we begin something what I call, and we're on page 15 now, which I call a phased reopening plan. Uh, and that would provide on September 1 up from three to five, we don't know what yet, but three to five days solely of adults uh, working in buildings to prepare for students. So those first three to five days, uh, we're being told that it's definitely 177, but it might be 175. Uh, they're gonna get a waiver on the uh, state law to allow districts to have students for only 175 days. Mm -hmm. So we would have five days of adults working on planning for reopening. All of the change protocols, all the change procedures, plus remote learning, you name it, we got five days, uh, and we will be doing five days of training. Then, here's what's interesting. Anything that we do will be dictated by the numbers of students who select for fully remote learning. That has to be an option. We have to allow parents that option. So no matter what we do, the total numbers of our design will be driven by how many students select remote learning. Let me explain why. Five days of learning, what I propose uh, right after Labor Day is that the district reopen in the hybrid model using six foot distancing. Where we have four cohorts. Cohort A is our special populations which would be in school every day there is in-face learning. Those are substantially separate sped kids, a large percentage of EL students, and some students identified in the bottom uh, lowest performing 25% of students. We figure we could get that up to 4,000 students, given that perhaps there are 2,000 who sign up for remote learning. We then, cohort kids in cohort B and C, divide the remaining figures using 10,400 student enrollment, that's 2,200 students per cohort, and they would rotate for the sake of discussion tonight, not the plan, but an A-B model of week on, week off. But we know that could be two days on, one day of remote learning, and then the other two days. We haven't, you know, all those things have to be worked out. I'm sharing that with you tonight, as we know that that is a key piece that will have to be decided. I've given you the week on, week off, just for discussion, because as you'll see in the recommendations, there's other models. But I figured that would be the one that most folks were familiar with. So as we go, as you turn the page to page 16, using uh, this model, one core of students would engage face-to-face -face every day. We'd have rotating cohorts B and C. Cohort D, depending on uh, who opts in or hops out, we would maintain this posture up through November 15th. If at that time, either A, there's a vaccine, or B, the measures continue, the, the metrics continue to decline, we would move towards three foot separation, three foot distancing uh, at that time. If the numbers don't warn it, we wouldn't. We'd stay where we are. If the numbers get worse, we'll go to full remote. We're gonna be able to go whichever way we need to go depending on the safety of the students. But the goal is, across the year, is to build a plan where we'd have benchmarks and we're able to make assessments. We know that students that are in remote learning may want to come back once they see how it's working in person or their parents make that decision. And so we know that those figures will fluctuate. We know that in order to reopen, there are some operational imperatives that also must be in place. So if you go to page 17, I've articulated just 10 for tonight so you get a sense of what our thinking is. But my recommendation would be that all students, pre-K to 12, all students uh, are required to wear masks to the extent possible, minus eating, uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, this means every student and staff member and any visitor to the building uh, must have a mask on in order to gain entry. When I say to the extent possible, uh, of course there are some activities given separation where you could pull the masks off. And I know some districts are saying, well, kindergarten and first grade don't need to wear masks. I'm not taking that position tonight. I'm taking the position of, I want all kids to wear masks and you gotta prove to me why those kids don't. But that may be something, of course, that, that, that uh, 
uh, we recalibrate and change. Two, uh, that we will provide, as we articulated uh, what we've purchased so far, we will provide PPE and hand sanitizer and other preventative materials to schools and classrooms. <clears throat> Three, schools will be clean and sanitized each day, uh, but each facility will receive one deep cleaning process per week. We don't know which day that is yet, but that would be uh, a non-negotiable imperative. This is a big one. All outside groups, will, there will be no outside groups that will be allowed to rent school spaces. And visitors will only be allowed in the main office areas. Why? Because we cannot con decontaminate buildings once they're clean and ready with our kids. So that is going to be a problem that we've got to work through. I know that already. But I'm just being open and honest that that's something we really need to, to, uh, to take a look at. Five, students in classrooms will operate as cohorts, uh, meaning students will stay grouped together from start to finish to the extent possible. Now, we know at high school that's a challenge, uh, but this is something that we uh, would make it much more safe for, for both the adults and the students in the room. Coupled with that, specialist teachers would teach the cohort classroom in the classroom to decrease hallway transitions to the extent possible. So that means uh, using the hybrid model, we'd start with folks using the regular rooms to teach art and stuff as we could think about as we see how that starts working, we could use the art rooms if they're not being utilized. We could use the music rooms if they're not being utilized. We'll figure all that out. Uh, breakfast will continue to be served in the classroom after the bell, uh, but instead of providing lunch in the classroom, we would use the lunch rooms using six foot separations and go to our service delivery model, which is talked about in the prior pages of, of food, uh, being distributed and collected by our nutritional nutrition staff. We know that in doing that, each school would have to adjust their master schedules to compensate for the extra time to be able to have lunch and then some sort of recess type experience. We don't care if it's walking outside uh, or whatever, but something coupled with that to be able to get uh, in and out. Faculty and staff are provided with technology and training needed for remote learning. That's something we need to think about as we continue to purchase equipment. If we go to full school closure again, then we will provide the teachers who are doing the remote learning with the tools and technology to be able to do that. In the model of full remote without closure, uh, teachers, uh, faculty, staff would be expected to work in buildings and conduct the remote learning from our buildings if we stay in phase three. Uh, that's articulated earlier in the, in the document. Uh, students in cohorts B, C, and D uh, will be provided with a Chromebook as we, you know, we gave out close to 5,000 uh, that are, that are uh, 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 given out this spring. Uh, but the hotspot connectivity is something that we think we need. We know at the middle level we're getting at least 3,000 devices for all our middle school students that come with connectivity. When we take out those kids, we figure there are about 1,000 kids that may need connectivity. So if we do 1,000 times 400, that's $400,000 for hotspot devices for families that don't have them. We've applied for that in our uh, state grant uh, that's, that's going out, uh, uh, I think, tomorrow uh, with some of that money that the governor um, put out for schools. But that would be able to provide every single family with connectivity. So that's something that we take into consideration uh, with our planning. We also know that this plan, when we come to a final decision about our posture for opening, it's a 30,000 foot plan. It's the schools that have to operationalize that. So we would be using the Admin Institute the week of August 10th uh, for school leadership teams uh, and those folks, uh, classroom FRE folks who want to join to do their initial planning using uh, a planning rubric. If you look on page 18, there's a graphic. It shows the kinds of things that each school uh, has to think about, what transitions mean, how do you go to the nurse's office, what does breakfast, lunch, and, and, uh, and snack and water look like, et cetera, et cetera. All of the operational things that, that schools have to have in place. We would start that planning uh, once we have a final model the week of August 10th, 
and then that planning will continue up through those first five days of trainings, uh, et cetera. So uh, every di there is no template for this right now in the state, uh, but I'm happy that we developed this first color graph thing here. We, I sent out to the, all the superintendents in the state uh, as a starting point to get some sort of tool developed for site, the site level planning. Now there are a couple things that we don't know about yet, and they're articulated on page 18. Human capital, uh, human capital, uh, human, I got this backwards, so sorry for my dyslexia on this. It should have been human capital management and labor, but I wrote it as human capital labor slash management. Uh, but what has to be worked out is, what does this mean? What does it mean if I'm sick or I'm scared or, you know, what does it mean? How do I return to work? We got to work out all those details. Uh, legally, uh, there's, there's uh, been discussions with lawyers on, on uh, <coughs> management side and labor side, but these are things that we know we have to take on. I don't have any answers for you right now, but um, I know that this is something that we have to have conversations about and more guidance uh, from the state. Two, PPE. There's continued guidance coming out about what PPE is, and we've <coughs> ordered a whole bunch of stuff, and we'll continue to order uh, more, and then we also need to think about um, uh, commendations, uh, accommodations uh, for some folks that need specific kinds of PPE, uh, perhaps if they have a disability. So those are things that, that, of course, we have to look at and take on. And on page 19, if you see where the final thing where it says note, we also know that there are community engagement and parent engagement discussions with diverse groups of people that will of course happen and continue to happen as the planning evolves. We've done several surveys so far, but nothing is uh, compensates for in-person uh, discussion to solicit feedback and answer questions. Uh, we want parents to know that they will have options uh, next year. And that option around remote learning or in-person learning uh, will be their decision. We're being told that uh, we cannot mandate uh, kids being physically in school anymore. We can mandate they're part of our remote learning plan and they'll be counted on our roles and our October 1 numbers. That's one of the changes uh, this year. So the state will be counting all of that, uh, not as homeschooling, but as uh, uh, district-sponsored education and those kids will be uh, on our roles. So I articulate that there should have been another sentence here that says, again, everything that says before this is subject to change, but that's the world I'm living in right now. And there could be new guidance that comes out next week or the week after that changes everything I just said to you. Uh, but that is the reality. I will say to you that we have a solid uh, framework in place in terms of a path forward for what we think, for what we're thinking, for what an opening uh, could look like in the fall of public schools. Again, it's based on science and safety, that science being the six foot um, distancing. Uh, and we think that we can uh, get to where we need to be uh, in this time, I know you're going to have a lot of questions, and I know there will be uh, a lot of answers uh, back and forth uh, on this. I have a um, uh, community advisory committee uh, meeting on the Thursday, the 23rd. Uh, school committee members Larrabee and uh, Hart are on that committee. Uh, that committee's whole job is to poke holes uh, in this document. Uh, tomorrow, Every member of that committee will get a, a PDF of this entire binder. So they have everything you have uh, to be able to come in and have those conversations. Uh, we'll make uh, uh, also all members of the faculty and staff so they get a sense of what I presented uh, to the school committee again so that they can make comments as we continue to uh, make plans and, and figure things out. So with that, um, I'll take comments and answer questions that the members of the school committee may have. Um, Mr. Costa, then Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First, I want to start by thanking you, Mr. Superintendent, um, for what I know has been a long, arduous process, um, trying to balance <clears throat> the ever-changing guidance that we've been getting with, obviously, what the state's numbers look like balancing that with obviously 
what I think is most important, and that's the safety of not just our students, but also of all our staff. Um, and what I mean by that is, is not just teachers and paras, um, you know, custodians, um, they're going to be doing the cleaning, the deep cleaning, maintenance people going to be in there preparing classroom spaces. And if there is a case um, going into those areas, knowing that there's been a positive case and, and making sure that that's properly cleaned and disinfected so that we don't have a spread. The cafeteria workers, we're going to hand out uh, meals to our students. So when I say safety of our students and our staff, I mean everybody collectively. Um, and again, I know that this is, is, is a difficult uh, process to go through. Um, looking at the reopening task force members, you got a, a, a wide range of, of knowledge base on this team. Uh, and I'm very confident, as I think I mentioned to you, either in a text or a call that we had, that I'm confident that at the end of the day, whatever plan that you put forth as a recommendation for this committee to choose from, will be one that's well vetted. Uh, we'll take into consideration um, all of the things that I know myself and members of this committee would be concerned of, not just as school committee members, but as parents of, of uh, children in this district. Um, I want to thank Ms. Larravee and, and Mr. Hart for their uh, agreeing to serve um, on the advisory as well as, as the planning. Um, I just have a couple of questions, Dr. Malone. Um, and I know, and number seven, I think you talk about lunches, we're going to be in the classroom, and that schools would be looking to um, come up with a schedule. Are these schools able to reduce the number of students necessary during lunches to allow for that six-foot spacing without having lunch start at like 9.30 in the morning and end at, at 1.30? I mean... Is that realistic? I mean, I know, and I appreciate Mr. Uh, Pacheco and his team for measuring classrooms. Have we taken a look at how many lunches are we talking in order to accommodate that at a school um, like Viveris or some of these bigger elementary schools or at the high school? Are we going to have six lunches, one starting at you know 10 in the morning? And if, you, if, if that's been given some thought, if you could share that. If not, um, maybe that is, uh, no pun intended, food for thought going forward because the reality is if you got to feed all these students and you have to spread them thinner so to have less students in the cafeteria space, when do those start and when do they end? And, and so, um, and how is lunch chosen for a student? Do I, you know, do we randomly select students? <coughs> um, I know it may be minor, um, but that's just something that comes to mind. Um, another question, and I, I can wait to see if you have a response, Mr. Superintendent, or if you want me to keep going. I just, well, I, I just, I just comment real quick. Okay. So, to answer your question, great analogy, food for thought. Uh, part of the answer, that is part of the answer, but two, we would be expanding the, the base timelines to be able to do that, reducing uh, some class time. Students would be traveling in cohorts, so in terms of who goes, but don't forget, under the model that we're proposing, uh, there'd probably be six tenths of the kids that were normally in the building in the building at one time. So we have less numbers anyway. And at six foot separation, uh, we've got a pretty good chance that it's, it's not even doubling, but it's like, so if the high school has uh, three lunches now, we think we might be able to do it in four and a half or five around, you know, so five, because there's no such thing as half, but five. Uh, in terms of the timeline, it definitely extends. Uh, but we would work out those details uh, the next iteration of planning for us, we'll have deeper analysis of lunch, mm -hmm. and I'll have those figures back to the committee is in the next iteration of our planning. Right, so that brings me to my next question. I know we've, we've, we're basing this on cohort A, B, and special populations, and there are gonna be um, an expectation that they all come in every day, and then cohorts um, B and C are gonna rotate. Have we done the work necessary to know or have some numbers at this point of how many students each of those cohorts would make up in terms of, so you're, you're basing some of this planning on less students being in the building, but do we actually know or have a good sense of how many students we're looking at? So we, in that cohort A, it's about 4,000 students that up to, we could 
we think that we will be able to serve. If there's 2,000 that select entirely remote learning, mm -hmm. that would leave us 4,400 kids that we would divide into two cohorts. Okay. So on any given day, there'd be 6,000 or up to 6,400 kids in that model. But I don't know yet, and again, this is why mm -hmm. it's, it will all be driven by the numbers that pick remote learning. So if we can't do 4,000 daily because only 100 kids pick remote learning. Mm -hmm. Well, so that brings me to, I guess, the, the second yeah. piece of that is at what point are determinations going to be made so that parents know what cohort <clears throat> or, or, or I guess we'll just stick with the word cohort, which cohort their student will be in? Because at some point, we've got to make that permanent. So, so if a parent commits, they need to understand that changing this obviously changes the dynamic of the plan. Yep. And so if you don't have to, if, if you don't have a situation where parents are asked to commit to a cohort, then you have a lot of unknowns going into September in terms of if everybody just decides, hey, cohort, you know, B looked good. Uh, actually, I was going to do D, but now I want my kid to go to school. You may not have the capacity to, to, to run cohorts B and C. So if we, we would, in an ideal world, we would finalize the final plan on August 10th. Okay. In an ideal I mean, are we, are, are, am I on the same page with you in terms of at some of point there's got to be a commitment to if to you're going to do remote learning? Exactly. They got to understand the implications of that and that if we don't have 2,000 students commit to cohort D, then you got to come up with a different strategy cohort for B a and gets C. Cohort A smaller. Right. Because B and C is going to look different if more people right. choose to. It would be cohort A would be smaller and B, B and C would be larger, but you're right. So what, what I would hope for is that we would get to some sort of definitive plan and be public with what it, it is on August 10th and then allow for some choice in the week that follows and then into the planning. And don't forget, like, in cohorts would be sibling preference and, and, and other preference that we'd be able to get group families in together or those kinds of things which we'd right. want to do. And the other part of this is, again, that's in the whether it's week on or two days on is, is irrelevant, but it's not because we have to look at what other communities locally are doing in terms of the split. Now, we're pretty confident that everyone's going to be at the hybrid model, but we don't know what the split is. So let's say you're a teacher, third grade teacher of Averis, but you live in Somerset and you've got two kids and Somerset's not on week on, week off. And you're a teacher. How can, you know, how can we work that, you know, mm -hmm. so um, we're trying to figure all those things out. Right. The but other piece is I, I, in terms I, I, of... August the, 10th is about where we want to be for And I know this is preliminary and I'm sure that everybody's going to have questions and as I go through this proposal we got tonight, I'm, I'm sure I probably have more um, prior to uh, August 10th. Um, another thing that piqued my interest when you talked about, you know, people on, pe students in cohort D transitioning to cohorts B or C over time. I think you used November as sort of the, the benchmark um, for that. My concern would be, and I'm sure you know, the curriculum people have looked at this, but will that align? So if I've been cohort D, I'm at home remote, strictly remote, and I decide, wait a minute now, as a parent, schools are safe enough and I want to be in part of cohort B or C, is my son or daughter going to be able to transition into those cohorts without feeling as though they've missed what's been going on in the instruction in classroom on those alternating days or are they going to be able to seamlessly come off remote learning into those cohorts and feel as though they haven't uh, missed a beat or or fallen behind so that that is what our people are working on now is that okay. alignment between <clears throat> the remote and the core content standards so if we think about mm -hmm. standards across the state or across the district if you will with those state standards uh, the ideal for us is where we want to be, of course, is that it doesn't matter where you are because you're all getting the same thing. But in reality, there will be some gaps that were created from March through you know, June and then this summer. So we, we know that if we can get the alignment right, which is what we're working on now, we'll have the best possible chance so that no one feels that they uh, were behind in any of the areas. I just have 
two quick things um, it, along the same lines with you know receiving information or collecting data from um, our parents regarding what their asks will be uh, for their students have we and I know we talked about this briefly have we done that with our staff do we have a sense of on September 1st as we open up in these cohorts how many of our staff are committed to coming back how many of them have some apprehension how many of them may not be able to come back just given um, their own personal medical or health situations have we gone through and explored that because again planning for cohorts and classrooms and that's that's you know well documented I just I just want to make sure that we're going to have enough staff so, to pull off each of these right. uh, proposed um, cohorts or, 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 or proposals um, come September. Great question. So two things. One, I just want to clarify one thing. One of the things in terms of students coming back, uh, <clears throat> Maria Ponce and I are going to write this other part of it when we get this better, but we'd have different points in the calendar where you would say where the curriculum is aligned, you know, if you'd like to return, this is the time to do it mm -hmm. because of the alignment, and we would right. work through that. We did not, when we surveyed teachers, ask the question, are you going to return? Because it, it's a loaded question. We will be asking teachers those things moving forward. I didn't want to ask it without state guidance because right now, DESE and the major labor organizations are having conversations about this topic. So we don't, I've had conversations, and I don't, um, you know, I can state the, with President uh, Cusick here, uh, we've had conversations about, we know we're gonna need uh, greater guidance from the state, we're gonna need some legal guidance, and we're gonna develop uh, more MOUs about what that would mean. So. Pre-existing conditions, if folks can't return, what does that mean? If I'm just scared, what does that mean? And there are different meanings of those things. So we didn't ask the, want to ask the question in the survey yet. Uh, do, you, do you feel like returning? Although we know we're going to have to ask those questions moving forward. But one of the things that I've been talking with my association's legal counsel about is to ask it in a different way uh, around... Um, What is your reasoning not for returning, and is it documented? Though, using those types of questions to get more concrete so we can understand this isn't about, because the expectations around what the contract says in terms of work schedule, it's right. all uh, tied together. So we're going to be, a, a lot of that work is yet to be defined, Mark. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I should have said up front with, with all this, like all that deep level stuff, and that's why I put the <coughs> labor management you know, I, stuff. And there's, there's plenty of information in here. I, I mean, it's a lot to go over. I just, as I'm sitting here, I'm listening to the plans and I just want to make sure that, you know, that, that we're on that topic of however you ask the question. You know, I, I think it's more intrusive to say, you know, you know, are you not coming back? If so, why? And is it documented? I think that's more intrusive than sort of just getting a flavor for how many people's confidence is there. And if not, I, have they identified it as being, you know, gaps in, in the, the safety measures that we're putting in place? Is it, is it gaps in them feeling as though we don't have sufficient PPE? Is it, what are those areas that have people reluctant to come back? So, uh, because no. for a lot of people, this is, this is right. it's scary, uh, quite frankly, but yep. we, we still are in a business of educating children and, and um, we can put all these precautions in place, but nothing's gonna be 100%. Um, just like going to you know, your local supermarkets, not 100%, but I think if collectively as a group, with the guidance of your, your team you've assembled, uh, put measures in place, I just want to make sure that we're going to have the uh, appropriate number of staff to get the work that we need to get yep. done done in September. So one of the, just uh, want to present it to the committee tonight. We know that, that uh, those questions about how folks, once they are able to digest, that's why we're going to email it to everybody so mm -hmm. everyone gets a sense, full transparency. Then we can start those conversations about, you know, someone will say, I don't feel safe without X. That's something we could, mm -hmm. we could do, and that right. provides more folks the ability to, uh, to work. So, and just lastly, I, and, yeah. and I'm going to yield because I, I feel like I've taken up 
too much time, and I apologize to my colleagues, but the last thing, in terms of special programs, I've mentioned this over the years, not necessarily with the foresight that you know, COVID would strike, but in terms of bus transportation, have we looked at consolidating special programs in schools where those neighborhoods draw the most students for that special program? I know in the past we've designed special programs at Sylvia, we've had them at Doran, or Turner, I believe. We've had them strategically placed throughout the district, which in some cases has required students to be transported from the opposite end of the city to that school because they participated in that special program. Have we looked at if it does come down to a situation where busing is going to be an issue, do we have the capacity in some of these schools to combine special programs so that we could eliminate or reduce the number of transportation we're doing for students who need that program? And yes, after sir. that answer, yep. uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield. So one of, the, uh, one of the examples that I can just give off the top <clears throat> of my head is, is we've expanded the foundational program in the neighborhoods where kids live. Like So for example, that's expanding now in the sixth grade to be at all three middle schools. So you're not going to be paying transportation all the way to Talbot uh, for those kids that live in all three uh, parts of the city. So that's an example of how we're trying to reduce uh, transportation costs uh, in terms of consolidation, uh, Mr. Loesch has done, a, I think, a really good job of really looking at uh, special programming and building, uh, uh, you know, and some of our substantially separate programs, building um, uh, either cohesion within a building or within a middle school that's nearby uh, so that we can have uh, less of that busing all over the city for special program. As we continue to roll out uh, the gate or what we're going to be calling, you know, the, hopefully the, the honors program as we continue to roll, I think that that will also be a place where we'll see reduced uh, costs in transportation, not immediately, but this year there's no gate in fourth grade, so that's a start. Uh, and then we'll go fifth grade and we'll continue to roll out uh, from there. <coughs> so all great questions, all things that, uh, that we're, con we, we're considering. And again, I want to thank the committee uh, for their uh, uh, comments and questions at any time to help see things that I don't see. So thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, there's not much more I have to add to what my, uh, Vice Chairman Costa asked, but I do have one, a couple questions. But I do want to thank you, Mr. Superintendent, and the staff for putting this together. This is very good. And I think, um, you know, these are very uncharted waters we are, uh, we're in right now. Um, it's very unfortunate, uh, but this is absolutely necessary. Um, but I, I do want to ask you, you mentioned about, um, and I had a big concern uh, for the last maybe three, four meetings about home students that are home, uh, remote learning, and they're having a, a you, you mentioned tonight that you're confident that the students will have, as far as connectivity, they'll be able to um, have that connection through hotspots, you said. If we purchase them. Right, okay. So we, we've written a grant now. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't know if we're going to be rewarded but we anticipate with the middle level program rollout that there will be approximately 1,000 students that don't have connectivity. So if we gave those 1,000 students hotspots for the 10 month period uh, through, what's the provider, through uh, Verizon, uh, that will cost us roughly 400,000. All right, and just to um, maybe educate me a little bit more, how does the hotspot work? All right, so the hotspot is, uh, it speaks to the, yep cloud, if you will, as a device that sits anywhere near you, and it's essentially, a lack of a better term, like a modem uh, that your device hooks into and it gives you uh, the uh, internet connection. So it, it, when you take your phone home and you go home and your phone's on um, Wi-Fi and you're at your house, your house, you'll be connected to your house. If you're in my office, it's going to say something different. But that, whatever that connection point is, router is another term, uh, is what the hotspot will be for that family. So they don't need to buy cable and all that stuff yep. if they have these um, little devices. Now remember in the old days, they kind of looked like phones. I don't even know what they look like now. Uh, but they're small little things that uh, you plug in so it gets power and then your, uh, your, your device hooks up to it. In this model, we'd be using the Chromebooks as the devices um, across 
across the district. So it will be hooked up uh, to the uh, um, Chromebook and we would be controlling it. So it would be part of our system, am I right, Frank? So that in terms of our firewalls and all of those uh, things, our protections, the hotspots will be part of that. So kids wouldn't be able to do X amount of things, only Y amount of things. So that's, that's really the intent of it. It gives the, the ability for without a home or Starbucks or someplace that has Wi-Fi connectivity, it gives you the ability to have it. Okay, and, and we're, we're pretty much, um, if that, when do you think that grant might um, come through? Well, we're in, in a couple of weeks. So uh, I want to thank the uh, city's grant writer uh, for working with our team. She wrote two grants for us in the past week, both on the topic of technology uh, for, the, for these competitive grants uh, for these purpose. Because that, that is a major, major um, obstacle to get, to get over the kit. We need to have that connection. Uh, for the students that are, that the mother that the parents have decided to keep home for whatever reason safety wise I, I understand that but that's something that we need to um, you know easily by August 10th or a little maybe a week after that we have to real we have to know that for sure yep. because we need to have all the students um, that decide to stay at home uh, learn from home and have the ability to do so so, so it, it, no matter what within this model uh, we know that if it's not the grant, it's some other source that we're going to have to fund approximately $400,000 for hotspot connections, and we'll figure that out. I know the mayor has been uh, great during closure. We made some connections with both Verizon and Comcast. It was just it was too cost prohibitive at the time. Yep. But we know what the cost is, um, and uh, I wish we had uh, philanthropic support of some of the foundations that that did Boston and Lawrence and places like that with these hotspots, but but uh, we didn't we you know we didn't get any of that, uh, so we're going to have to fund it our own. But hopefully this grant comes through. All right, I, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all. T Tom, then Kevin. Uh, yeah, Dr. Malone, uh, going down the list, um, he said uh, we're going to have to move around, use all the available spaces we have in schools, such as cafeterias and music rooms. That's at three feet. That's at three feet. Yep. And I mean, that's so I was preparing, I was presenting this the way we wrote it. But we talked about at three feet, you would have to use all those spaces. Do you, do you anticipate that happening or? I, it, no, I, if we stay in the hybrid model, which I would support, we do. Meaning we go with maximum safety is the, is the guiding uh, starting point for us. Uh, we would not need to use those spaces, but we took a very conservative approach based on like the recommendations that we said we would have those specials travel to classes so we didn't have kids more transitions in the hallways. But there's also science and feedback that I got from the teachers and, and, and other administrators that it actually would make more sense to use those spaces because then those teachers would have to travel less and if they're in the age group where they're spread more, maybe that makes more sense. So those are things that we would look at. At the six-foot model, uh, we are pretty confident that we will be using uh, the special spaces for those classes. What about this? Uh, I'm curious to know how curriculum is going to work in the, with remote and class in the hybrid model. Is curriculum going to be cut in half, or does curriculum stay on track for the kids that are in the classroom and the kids at home at the same time. Is the curriculum moving forward all together? So it's always moving forward. So, so for example, if, if, we were, uh, if you were a ninth grader in English and you're in school for a week and you're studying um, theme of, uh, give me a ninth grade English theme, standard, uh, narrative text. You're looking at narrative text. Sure. You're doing something that week in person with your teacher. That second week when you're home, you could be doing ingenuity units of study on narrative text, coupled with continually reading the book and highlighting it, coupled with there could be uh, uh, differentiated small group instruction on the text with specialized providers, whether they be English teachers or special ed teachers. So you see that second week blended, but we're not stopping what we did and reviewing. 
it's continual uh, curriculum progress, if you will. As far as the state standards are concerned, uh, have they been somewhat relaxed? No. Well, this, the problem with the state standards is you look at it and you read it and go, oh, my God, there's 8,000 things. There really isn't 8,000 things, but it's written that way. So in terms of the state has a set of standards for every content area and every grade, what we need to identify is what is the most important learning from those standards. So, so in terms of what the direction we've received from the state is, they've spoken specifically about um, if we're doing our own curriculum development, which we're trying to populate. Because one of the options is the state may also purchase some online academy, which would also be something that we could use, but there's a, there's a cost to that as well. So the state would buy it, but then they charge each district. And depending on our budget, that may be cost prohibitive. Uh, but in terms of the alignment of the standards, as you mentioned, uh, yes, they've they, they're reduced the, or the, <coughs> How do I say it? There's some leniency uh, provided and flexibility some now. Leniency. Some leniency. And also around, as you see, just the numbers of days and probably hours uh, have to be adjusted. So, the time on so, learning? Well, the time on learning. So 990 at the secondary level and 900 at the elementary level. We've asked for flexibility, and the commissioner has said, you know, these are things that he's heard, he's not given it yet, but he understands that that's a real need for us particularly as Mark mentioned, like with providing lunches, that's gonna change the time in learning, right. is, if you will. So we're gonna need relief uh, from that. And let's say on that one day, let's say it was a two day on, one day everyone's remote, then two day on again. What does that one day remote look like in terms of, uh, of, of that? So those are, all, uh, those are all things that again, we continue to get information, uh, but I think the state's been very responsive to the need for leniency and flexibility. Are we gonna to have to provide whiteboards in spaces that there may not be a whiteboard if that space needs to be used for classrooms? Yeah, well, so if, if, if there are spaces that we need to turn into classrooms, um, we would do that. I, I will say that in most of our buildings now, all the spaces that are set up for learning have the basic operating materials that they need. Uh, Granted, we know that Talbot a year ago had some not some good not not good uh, whiteboards. We've added and changed uh, a whole bunch there. So that's a uh, a yes that if we were to use a room that wasn't uh, set up as an instructional area, we would have to make it an instructional area. Thank you. With that, I yield. Kev, so uh, just following up on <clears throat> the question of the off weeks for the teachers. Can you just walk me through what would, what would it look like for a teacher? So if I'm, let's say, a third grade teacher, if I taught my kids in person Monday, Tuesday, would I be responsible for that same group on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Or would I have to be teaching another group of different kids on Thursday and Friday? So, so if you were in school, let's use that example, you're the classroom teacher for that group of kids on Monday and Tuesday, using universal design, you get the whole group of kids that you get every day, and then you get these other two groups, and how, do you do, how does it progress every single day? The alignment of the, so for example, I'll use that ninth grade again, that ingenuity programming that we own, that the ninth grade English class, we would align the ingenuity activities with what we're doing in the classroom and have a seamless ninth grade experience for those kids. So what it would mean for the teacher is on Monday they're doing, or let's call it a week, and have a weekly lesson plan with daily lesson plans Monday. By the end of today, students will know and be able to, and that's gonna build off each day. So it's not start and stop. What's not defined yet, and needs to be defined, and will be defined, uh, is for example, what if there are teachers who cannot return because of some medical reason. Do those teachers become additional online support teachers? So they're actually doing synchronous instruction, meaning you're looking at the device and I'm looking at the device like we do with our meet, uh, not Zoom, we use uh, Google, Google Classroom. Google Classroom. 
that we would have teachers teaching co you know, large cohorts of kids using that model, if that's what we agree to when we get to the details about what it means yeah. if you're My, going to return I, I think I might have either misstated what I was asking. Would the teacher, let's say I have 20 kids, 17, whatever the number would be, yeah. Monday, Tuesday, are those my students for the year? Yes. So then on Thursday, Friday, I work with them on the ingenuity model and stuff, but that's it. Yes. I'm not getting another 17. No, you're, you're on your, you know, if you're a class you size, if you're a fourth grade teacher it. and you've got 26 kids, those are your 26 kids, but each day it's going to be around 17. Right. But it's so they the, would same the same 26 kids. So they're not going to get doubled up as No, question. I mean, we, A, the, the numbers don't support it because we still have the same amount of teachers and the same amount of kids. Yeah. So it's Mark, you know, Mark's question about if people aren't returning, what does that mean for staffing? This is where we get into the weeds of, well, if you're not returning and you're no longer an employee, I still have a budgeted teaching position I have to fill. What we're really worried about right now, Mark, and this was raised in a meeting with Rebecca today, is substitutes. You know, Maria Ponce brought that up. And I think you sent me an article a week ago about the dearth of substitutes, not only in the South Coast, but across the Commonwealth. But what does that mean now with this? It, it's something we've got to really get into. And again, this is where we get into the details. So do we run phys ed, or do phys ed teachers become literacy teachers? And on days where I don't have classroom teachers, is the phys ed teacher now teaching third grade? And we're not running phys ed that day. These are things we ought to work through, and we will. Uh, but it's, it's uh, I don't have, I can't give you a definitive answer yet because all of those details have to be worked out, and they will be. And you know, one of the things, what's the, what's, what's kind of the echo no one hears it, but what, the kind of thing that's running throughout this report. And me and Ken haven't had a vacation day yet, and I don't think we're going to this summer. I mean, and Maria, too, and think about all the, all the work we got to do to get ready. I mean, it's crazy how much you think about the what-if questions. One of the things that we focused on, and I, I want to thank my team for sticking to it, um, you know, we don't, we don't answer hypotheticals, because there's so many what-ifs. We could go down rabbit holes of, 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 of what-ifs. We're going to continue just to, to plan and get deeper to deeper to deeper. Not all the answers will be there, but most of them will be. And we'll have protocols in place to deal with most things, but there'll still be unknowns. But we've got a lot of planning to do. We've got a short time to do it. We've been asked to do a Herculean task. Unfortunately, it's, it's become very political. You guys read uh, all that stuff that's happening with the, it's so specific about school opening and you know who's for it and who's against it. And, what the president said and what the governor said and like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, you know, we can only do is what we can do. So we're going we're gonna to go from there. I agree with you on the substitutes. I had a mock here to say increase the substitute pay, which I think we need to do anyway. Well, we're, we, it was, yeah. Uh, so we, we had that's a, something we should do no matter what. Yeah. Regardless, so I'll, but now I hope we might on, have to. Uh, August, in August, we'll bring forward a proposal on uh, subs again. That's, that, that's on our list anyway. Yeah, right. And it, it, it always is. We pay way too little. Substitutes. I mean, these guys can uh, are vouch for the fact that it's very hard to compete in a small market for Got subs, it. given what we pay. The um, uh, comments about the people giving you the definitive that their child wants to go to 100% remote. I personally think we should be asking that question now and locking people in, mm -hmm. so well, that you can. We did the survey in general to start, and that's so that's already been out. So now, once. We start getting more information here. We will do specific with names who would like to be in, in, to start hearing once they hear of our plan, because then we get a real list. That's and a, we can the actually sooner have, the better, I think. Yes. Not wait until the tenth well, would be. We know my... that we're going to have remote learning no matter what platform we go to, because the state has made it clear students must be educated, and if they don't want to come to school, we can't make them. So, right. so you're so as soon as this goes out, I'm going to start getting that kind of information, so on the 10th, I can give you more definitive numbers. Right. Um, the high school, you know, when you talk about the ages of the students that are able to do online learning, remote learning e more easily than others in middle school to high school and all that. I worry about the high school with the ventilation, with the, you know, we built a new school because it was a mess and the, the ventilation was terrible and all this stuff. <clears throat> so I think there should be some focus on what do we do with the high school age? Uh, I also look at, do we need to change any of the rules we have for graduation? I can picture a situation where a student's a senior, they've got a couple of major subjects that they need, 
and then a bunch of electives. Could we potentially give them early college, give them some college credit, create a course that way online, so that that student doesn't even have to come to the high school, so that we can increase the number of students that are not required to be in the building. Uh, for those, I, don't, I haven't done the analysis, but usually that's what happens, is that the senior year, you don't have a robust schedule of full courses. Could we do something like that or work with BCC to you know, give them a college credit? So uh, the, um, the commission has given high school principals uh, across the Commonwealth some flexibility and, and leeway to make those decisions, and they have been making. My understanding is moving forward, we're still doing credit recovery. We're still doing uh, early college, uh, junior college credit, and we're still doing uh, other um, uh, models to be able to reward credit in unique situations. So the answer to your question, yeah. Is it a possibility? The answer is yes. So when we think about like, I don't know if you read the plan of uh, one of the school, one of the big school districts in the, in the country, uh, their 11th and 12th graders will all be online and everyone else will be in. Um, and they did that for a reason. I don't know what the reason was, but they made that decision uh, to, to uh, focus on the, uh, have more ability, I guess, with the, the younger kids. But those are things to consider as we continue our planning. Right, yeah. The um, only a couple of points. The hotspot uh, issue with the, I know we applied for the grant and all that, that's always been an issue for me and what we can do. but. As a city itself, a poor city, like I wonder what we can just do to give everybody, the, you know, we're working, and I've never talked to Comcast or any of those folks, but is there any way to just give free internet to the whole city with, with CARES Act money or anything? I, I'm just I've, saying like- I've had the conversations, know? I know the mayor's had the conversations yeah. of, what we're dealing with the problem is, is it, it's a business and it's a utility though that makes money. Um, and there's nothing that provides it as a, is a basic human right yet that they could say that either the city's funding it for everybody or it's state is or it's or it's free. So the answer is, yeah, there's a way to do it, but it's hugely expensive. Yeah. Um, when you say a thousand hotspots, I have no yeah, technical. Yeah, that's just 10 months of a thousand right, hotspots. But I'm not even having, I have no technical knowledge of this, but if you put a thousand spots across the city for, for $400,000, you would think that a lot of people could tap into it, to that across the so city. One of the things that we looked at, and as you know, it, in uh, April was if we put hotspots in areas near schools and towers or wherever and roofs, the families could come to parking lots because the distance, what do, we, what do we got, about a 25 foot distance with a hotspot for a hookup? What? Yeah, so you, you don't have, um, you know, it's not like one's, you can have one a mile away and people yeah. get Maybe on. if you could, if I could just ask you, give a one pager from the, our experts. To us, just to start a dialogue about curiosity. Yeah, that's on fine. That. Well, I think so that's important. One of the things I mean, one of the things I want to put together um, in general as we get deeper on this is, A, for the missing kids, what it would be for everybody. But the good news is that we did get that middle level grant. So there's 3,000 kids that are getting the device and the connectivity no matter what. But we'll put together uh, an analysis about you know, option to have it for the thousand kids or whatever it costs for all kids, or even what models we could put in place to, is if we think about connectivity hubs in Fall River. Yeah, so uh, my last comment is just on the start and end times uh, that we talked about with the schools and the busing and all that stuff. Uh, is the timeline for that August 10th? You know, so I know you got to negotiate and all that stuff, but so, yeah, we need to give notice to the parents. Start and end time because we haven't made a decision yet on the model. And for doing three foot with all kids, it's a totally different start and end time. We're gonna run double the number of buses. So if we did this model that makes the most sense for us, uh, we can set up the windows pretty quickly of start and end times. This right, is a so, shell. Yeah, Remember, no, I, without the ELT at those four buildings, sorry, um, you got, you know, the, it's no longer seven to, you know, it doesn't happen, you, you know what I mean? So I hear what you're saying. Right. I just, when, if I'm sitting back looking at the timing for the way things are going, I think you're, you're backed up too far. I, I understand the thing we need to talk to people, we need to work these committees, but I think you're, you're putting yourself up real close to uh, the start of school with that time. Whereas if we just made a decision to say we're going to go to the 
recommended model sooner, I think at that point you'd have a couple of weeks sleep time. You know, I, I just think backing it up, backing it up yeah, is well, going to be very I mean, difficult. I'm, you know, I'm laying out a path for you guys so you understand what our, my thinking is and what my team is thinking is. We're going to put more meat on the bones over the next few days. We've got the feedback session on Thursday to add even more meat to the bones. I'll have a whole bunch more stuff next week, uh, you know, that we can continue to start, yeah. so start just, getting uh, and I'm going to yield after this. My thought is just listening to what you said. Looking today, I mean, you just gave this to us. I looked at it quickly. It really, we don't have an option to do anything other than the model that you're recommending because we're not going to increase the transportation by $6 million. So in my mind, I, we could still get feedback on how to do it, but I think the, the three-foot model, everybody coming to school together, should be off the table as of today. As far as I'm concerned, that'll give you a better guidance to not have to go back to, you know, I think personally, yeah, I, I mean, as as I, I, one member, I mean, I want to get feedback too, but <clears throat> you presented that we can't, we don't have $6 million to, to do the three foot, so why keep on kicking that can down the road? Yeah, Let's I'm, just say it's out. I'm not planning for the, that model anymore. I'm planning deep on what I proposed tonight, but I do have to submit to the state those three options. That's, a, a, I have to do that. <clears throat> so we'll be prepared for those three, but it's not crazy. No, they're not 19 page narratives for each one. It's like two pages for each one. But we're going down the road from everything I've heard from the committee tonight um, to get to where you just described, which is we know what makes sense. This is Fall River. We're in control of our destiny. We're trying to take care of the kids, the teachers, the lunch providers, the custodians, everyone that we've mentioned safely, and that the model that makes sense for us is this staggered phased in reopening and, th and that's yep. what no I, I, I just was trying to make sure we give you some flexibility I do appreciate your work you've done and the work that your team did this is not easy uh, no decision is going to be perfect but you're doing the best you can I think the committee the city's doing the best they can so keep up the good work and I'm here to help in any way thank you I yield Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think okay. Josh, okay. yeah I, I don't have okay. any questions I just want to mention I just want to say great job, you know, tremendous task. I look forward to seeing it pan out and, and uh, you know, hearing about what, exactly what we're going to do moving forward. So thanks to everybody on your team who put this together. Tom? Yeah, just, uh, just as a joke, if we go with the three-foot model, we can get a couple of London double-decker buses for the kids <laughs> up on top, you know what I mean? <laughs> Twice as many kids on one bus. <laughs> Maybe we buy it. But, uh, but you got to understand all, it's six foot in a cubic <laughs> construct. Well, in all seriousness, so Dr. Malone, this was a great job, and I want just want to know with all of these proposed, with all of these proposals, is it going to require any changes to the policy manual that we have? Uh, there definitely probably will be, but none that I can come up with yeah, right it's, now. Yeah, it's not. I'm not looking. At no, no, but there definitely will be. In the you know, we're gonna. I've held off on the policy subcommittee meeting because none of it's mission critical but we do have a list of things that we're, that we're going to start reviewing yeah. on the on the policy subcommittee so that subcommittee you know as soon as the year starts i'd like to get that something scheduled so we can start looking at what we need there and then i'm sure there'll be some uh something that comes out of the reopening as well but i'm impressed with the amount of team players that you have that work very hard to compile this and uh it's a credit to you the organization and uh, our community players, and with that, I yield. Okay. I, I just have a couple things myself. Um, I, I look at the numbers that you put out with the six-foot population, that it, we could accommodate 9,000. Then you told us that 2,000 were probably going to be home, which takes our population to around 8,500. Yeah, I mean, 8,400. 8,400. All right. With that number, we don't have anything figured for daily absences, which is another group that's not going to be in the building. So I'm wondering why you're thinking that we can't accommodate those kids. Because again, it will all be driven by the numbers of kids that pick the remote learning. Right. Once we know that figure, I'll have a better sense. But again, I wanted to point out, this is based on a square footage tracker. That's why we went out and figured it out. So at 
Three feet, you can get about 22 kids in a traditional room. At six feet, it's somewhere between 17 and 19. Mm. So, you're, you know, could we fit everyone at once if we opt? It depends how many kids go remote. Well, you look at our middle schools, they're almost all. Yeah, but that takes, again, don't forget, this is every single space in the middle school. Gym, right. no, not library. Gym. This right here is the classroom. Yeah, this one, yeah. every single space. But So it's a square footage tracker that everyone used across the Commonwealth, just a state's tool. I don't have much confidence. I, 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 don't, I don't have the answers to this, but I do know that every time we have a meeting with the school committee, we talk about SEL models. These kids that are home on a computer or a hotspot, we, we're not addressing isolation. We're not addressing loneliness. These kids, I, I drive around the city a lot of days, even when they were home in March and April, and I saw six, seven, eight-year-old kids running around the streets during the day. And anybody who tells you they weren't is not being truthful with you. The, the, you know, I don't want anybody in the building if it's not safe. But I also read a lot, and I look at what's going on in Europe. I look at what the models are showing. I look at the state statistics that no one under 20, I don't think that anyone passed away in the state from COVID. Kids passing it to other kids is extremely difficult, and there, there's a ton of research going on right now to see if that even happens. The kids that did get it in one European school, they think they all got it from the parents. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, uh, a week on, a week off, how does, it, how does anyone work? What do they do with the kid during the week that they have them home when they have to go to work? I, I don't well, know I, if these I, think, I think these are real considerations that definitely every, every community is struggling with. Right. I think, the, I think from my conversations with folks, it's, it's really not so much the rate of spread with kids that people are worried about. It's the rate of spread with adults that are, you know, lack of a better term, above 50 and, you know, that range, that, that's what the, one of the fears is of, is 100% um, back to normal. It's actually the spread among the adults. And then what the other part of it that people are saying is that the kids that are asymptomatic, then if they're getting cared for by their grandparents, it spreads that way much more quickly. So that's what we're, you know, granted, we've given you all the science and medical stuff mm -hmm. from the state. Uh, these conversations are happening uh, everywhere. Within the next couple of weeks, I can give you more information based on numbers of what people are doing, which will give us a better sense of actually how many uh, kids we can fit. Mm -hmm. I think I've been clear with everyone that my goal as well is to get everyone back to school. That is my goal. If I can do this Safely. right, it will Safely. be by November 15th uh, that we could do that with three fourth separation. But again, there's a lot of numbers that, that will play on our ability to do that. So I think your, your point's well taken, Mayor. Everyone's struggling with this. You know, you're running a whole city. You understand the, the, uh, the need as well because you work in schools. You're right. The SEL component um, is a huge factor. We, you know, one of our committees is SEL and their recommendations are very uh, in line with, with a lot of, uh, of your thoughts. So. Um, again, a lot still unknown, but at least we're thinking about it and we'll, we'll update you as, uh, as we have more information. Yeah. Well, last week we had a couple of numbers bubble up on our daily count. One was 13, one was 14. And on the 13, we had some young, young, young Fall River residents in there. It kind of stunned me how young they were. And of the six or seven of them, one might have had a symptom. They didn't even know they had anything. Right. And so what I'm saying is, yeah, well, this is beyond asymptomatic. They, they had no clue where they got it. They had no clue um, <laughs> what they had. And it's, they, they went on with their life. As soon as they found out they were positive, they, they probably stayed home. But other than that, that was the only change in their life. So, I mean, I look at this, and I do not want people unsafe. But I do think that we have a generation of kids in the school that we told to go home, but we all thought, as you said earlier in your presentation, for a couple of weeks in March, and we never saw them again. Yep. We never saw them. We saw them on a, on a monitor. And uh, that was when we could get them to focus for a little while. Um, this is extremely challenging. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Durfee numbers here on this using six feet, I, I, you have no issues up there. 
I mean, I, I, do, I do agree. I know what, uh, what I believe Somerset's doing. The kids go to school for three or four periods in the morning, they hand them a bag lunch and tell them to go home. That's what I was told. I mean, like, kind of like what Kevin was saying. The sooner the kid meets his requirements, let him go. You open up slots in the cafeteria. You open up slots in classrooms. There are things we can do, um, but I'm not, I'm not really a fan of a week on, week off. I, I think that's got a lot of upheaval for a lot of families in Fall River. But I, that being said, I don't have the answers. So I look at it as how do we do this without the buses. I mean, when you're doing your survey, why don't you ask the parents if they could help us out? till November with getting the kids back and forth to school. If you're going to send your kid, was, Mrs. Coogan, is there any reason you can't get them there for us this year? We're tight the, as a drum. Right, that was part of the question. That was, That's part that of your that question? That was already answered. How many of you will not be using transportation that you qualify for? And what'd for? you get for that? What was the percentage on it? I don't know. Tracy's not here. I'll give you that. I'll give you yeah, that. Yeah, that'd be something to look at. Yeah. I, I think if you ask them that we tell them we need help, we can't transport everybody in the traditional way. Can you help us out this year? And maybe yeah, four of our people do but step we've up. We've also been told we can't tell people that qualify for transportation that they can't use it. No, I said ask. No, we, I, <laughs> I did not say tell. Yeah, but I get that. But when we're asking it, you we're ask just them. getting the information back. Yeah. But just, I can't build my plan around that. You get what I'm saying? Well, you're building your plan around asking them to stay at home. No, What's no. the difference? The state has told us very clearly that there is no longer such thing as mandatory compulsory attendance. So if you so ask them that we, they're gonna... If they are going to stay home, that's their choice. Right. But it's right. not that they're staying home homeschooling. Right. No, you're asking that's them a whole their other, plans. Right. So right. The, there's but nothing again, wrong with a plan. Can you help us with a plan? Oh, and again, we'll ask them, we'll continue to ask about transportation. It, it helps us out. I mean, even at three feet on a bus, using the six-foot school model, so three feet on a bus, what does that give us, Ken? 24, 24 kids on a bus. Yeah. So a 72 yeah. unit bus only holds 24 kids in that model. No, we That's a huge problem. Yeah. And we wrote in there, and when you'll see, we know that that's the most cost neutral, but there will be costs because of special populations, not the special populations that Mark's talking about, but the out of district placements totally change. Because it's six feet on many of those buses, you're only talking about one kid on a bus that used to be able to hold three. So th th there'll, there'll be some additional costs that we're already working out. Uh, to get to your point, Mayor, yep, we'll, we'll continue to, as we do these surveys and we're doing a lot, uh, we're gonna get more granular and we're gonna be asking for specifics regarding who are you and not just go online and fill out a survey, but you are Mrs. DePina and you're saying yeah. X. No, and, and again, no one on this committee doesn't think safety is the overriding concern, myself included. But I just really feel bad for these kids, um, and I'm, you know, we've got a graduation tomorrow. It's in, in the end of August, and I just think, I mean, in the end of July, I'm sorry. But uh, there's things we can hopefully get from this information that may make the schools a little more efficient and uh, give people a break. That's all I'm saying. Okay. You all done there, doctor? Okay. Let me ask you question. Oh, I'm no, sorry, Kev. Go ahead. No problem. Just uh, as you were talking about the uh, SEL, and we are all reading all kinds of different things. I read an article today. It was in a very interesting article related to uh, mental health and SEL, and it actually indicated the opposite of what you were just saying, which is the traditional way of everybody concerned about the mental health needs of students based on staying home. The, this article had a compelling case for there being issues if they come to school. And the things that you have to see in the, in the school are bothering these kids' mental health as well. Like traditional, um, it's not traditional as a, as a youngster to have to stay six feet away from everybody. Teacher wants to say, uh, build a relationship with the student, can't you know, get close to them, can't build relationships as well with them. So I, it was one of the first articles that I saw that actually played the other side of it. So I'm not saying where I stand on it, but it's <laughs> certainly interesting to read uh, all those things. So I'm sure you're taking that into consideration, no, Dr. Malone. But I agree. Nothing is easy here. No. I yield. Thank you. Okay. Next Ms. item up. Just one quick thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Mimi. It's okay. A um, again, from myself, Dr. Malone, excellent job, you and your team, and thank you wholeheartedly. Um, Durfee students, high school students, uh, just quickly. Um, these kids, these teenagers are ready to get back to school, they are ready to get back to life. If we have any concern, if I have any concern 
right now it's our high school kids. Um, we said that we can house them. They can go back to school, all of them, because Dorothy can accommodate all students. Is that what you said? The building can't, but that building takes all the square feet and wasted hallway space. In the classrooms, the answer is no. Okay. Classrooms at Durfee High are smaller than they are Watson and Rivera's. Okay. Um, so if we can probably fit at three feet, again, 21 kids right. in the class there, 22 maybe. Okay, our high school, with that being said, our high school kids ready to go back to school. They all want to go back to school. Um, now these kids are on city buses. Uh, do we have the capacity of the city buses, the South End kids, the, the deep North End kids, teens? Do we have those numbers for the city buses for these kids to get to Durfee? And, and the second part of this question is um, how do we select these kids that all want to go back to school, these teenagers? So I'll just, Ken, Ken will answer the transportation. In the cohort A that's there face-to-face, we would be selecting based on the guidance from the state of your neediest populations. So we looked at SPED, self-contained, we looked at EL, and we looked at what we've identified uh, over the past year with the state as the lowest 25 uh, per percent performers. So those are the groups that we've targeted, and we got analysis from kindergarten through 12th grade. Who are they? We would give them priority. doesn't mean they take it. If we had 4,000 seats, we'd figure out who was in that group, and then we'd open up other seats for, you know, first come, first, or whoever weighed the lottery, I don't know, um, and, and figure that out. And that would how you prioritize, whether it be week on, week off, or other model, whatever the model which is in vogue on the south coast, that's where we want to be, because we want to be aligned with, with the other districts, uh, if it makes sense. Uh, we'd pick that in terms of priorities to who gets who. We prioritize family. We could prioritize sports teams and those kinds of things if, if sports are even running. You get what I'm trying to say? Like, or yes. activities, if, you know, to make sure that the kids are in school on the same days that there are X, Y, Z events, those kinds of things. Uh, but all that, again, will be worked out over time. I'll let Ken answer the, the SRT uh, answer. So um, SRTA said that they... Traditionally, our buses were between 50 and 60 students on the trippers. So that's already more than half of what they will allow starting in September. Their regulations are 20 to 22. Um, they, would, they would put a maximum of 25. The request was for us to stagger our start times. So basically have two separate start times and run those trippers twice in the morning and twice in the afternoon. It's a huge problem for the high school, especially since it's starting time now. You'd, you'd figure it would take an hour. So basically, they drop the students off, start the route all over again, and then run that trip again. That would be the only way to get a full, um, a, a, a complete back to school with 2,000 students. So with 1,000 students, the 50% model, we're only talking about transporting 250 students. We're, we transport 50% of the students going to Durfee by S SRTA buses. So if we went to the half model, we would be transporting 250. It would be really close with our bus transportation to get those students there with 25 on a bus. Thank you. Uh, just a follow-up question. Um, with that being said, there are monitors on school buses. Every school bus in the city has a monitor, correct? How do we uh, make sure our high school students are safe on these buses with no monitors and they're not sitting next to each other, they're not holding hands yeah, and we, we doing don't. teenager things on the buses? Sure. Is there a way that maybe we can get some, some, some people to supervise this or is that? So so currently, you're absolutely right. Every, every um, one of our yellow buses, um, regular student transport has monitors. Some have two, depending on, on the, uh, the group that they're transporting. And then on the SRTA, they've never been monitors on the buses. I'm aware. Um, yeah. And um, that would be a big ask. It's 11, it's 11 buses uh, daily, uh, sometimes 12, depending on the season. Um, but on 
we'll call it 11 buses, it would be 11 more monitors um, that wouldn't be a part of the SRTA um, charge, so to speak. Right. So it would, it would be an expense on the, on the transportation side that we would have to uh, look for monitors and then who would own those monitors? It would be a school right. employee. At, I think at some at point, point it's almost superfluous putting these kids, these 25 kids on a city bus and not expecting the, well, one, expecting the bus driver to monitor the situation and two, expecting them not to sit next to each other. So um, it's just a thought, but. I, I can tell you that 25 kids on that bus would be sitting with each other because they're right. in, there are not many more than 25 seats to begin with. Right. So some students would opt to stand up. When we put 50 on there, there's quite a few of them standing up. <laughs> right. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Mayor. Jimmy. Anything further, guys, on the plan? Again, I think it's a, a lot of work into this, and uh, we've got more going forward. Next item on the agenda is the 11.2. 2020 budget discussion, Dr. Malone. So I have no information to share. There's no information that's come from the state since the last school committee meeting um, about the FY20. We're in 2020. 20, 20, I'm 20. sorry, the FY21 budget. That's 21 next. That's next. Oh. 2020. 2020. This one. But nothing to say. Don't we just closed out? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have more information on the 10th to answer any of your questions. Uh, we'll have some items. Kevin's on vacation. Uh, and at that time, uh, we'll have all the end of the year stuff for you guys. And uh, I feel confident uh, that we had um, the best uh, possible scenario uh, given the uh, end of the year. Yep. Just a request that if we could, in the meantime, between now and the 10th, get the actuals on the health care yep. uh, between now and then before yep. the meeting, just to review it. I'll just yep, Thank I'll you. make sure we get that. I'll we'll get that. I'll get that on Friday email. Thanks. Next item up, um, the 2021 budget, ditto, Dr. Malone? Yes, yeah, so that, okay. that was my point about okay. no additional information yet. We're hearing that perhaps um, there will be something prior to the end of July, but not to take effect until uh, September, so that means we'll be at another 112th for uh, August. August. Yep. So I brought this up last time that we were talking about um, a level services budget that the superintendent presented. I'm of the belief that we need to give him authorization to start to go based on that number so that he can actually hire some of the folks that and go through the process so we, you know, staff up for next year. And if we wait now until August 10th, I don't think that the superintendent has any authority to, to hire anyone. Uh, last year, I know we, I think we gave a I don't know, key positions or something like that, but I think the committee really needs to give him authorization to go based on the level of services budget that he presented. And then if we need to change that back, we can go to the other scenarios. But right now, I don't think we're given any guidance to uh, the superintendent to be allowed to move forward with some of these things while he's doing uh, all of these plans and everything else. So. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the level services budget as presented by the superintendent, which would allow him to hire staff as he needs to get ready for the start of the school year. And I would really ask my colleagues to support this because I think it's just the right thing to do for continuity of running a school district. Mr. Chairman, just a point of information. Yes. We already have an approved level services budget for 2021. We already did that. It hasn't been funded, but... We took a vote to approve FY 2021 we, level services budget. May I? Oh, was it, oh no, I'm sorry. You know we what? We approved like the big, huge one. We, we, we approved the Student Opportunity Act. Yes. I want to approve that the level it. services one so that he could therefore say, like, we have two school adjustment councils that we know we're going to hire, whether we wait till now or August 10th. What if he's got a great candidate? That candidate's going out and apply in other places. We're going to lose good candidates for key positions if we don't at least give him this authority. So how, how I think many, it's the bare minimum. I, how many, I'll how many positions are like that? Uh, it's extensive. I, I, what the level service budget, everything that we had this year that we carried forward, we showed you how we could do it. But what Kevin's referring to is we haven't filled any positions yet. Um, we're ready to fill positions right now that, we've, that we currently have budget, not 
anything that was new and proposed, just the current that have always been there because we do need to fill those, you know, for example, a second grade teacher that left, I'm gonna have a second grade, I need to fill that. So, so that's where we are, we're in the process that we've been interviewing and we got recommendations and we wanna pull the trigger on, on those. Can I second with an amendment? Go, go ahead. And I only do this as a proposed amendment that we allow the superintendent to not exceed in his professional salaries line item to exceed a level funded appropriation. Gives you flexibility within your professional salaries line only to prepare for staffing needs going forward in September. So it would only give you that flexibility. And again, I understand the need to hire and, and I want to do that. My reluctance is if we go ahead and adopt a, another amended budget. Um, it, it just opens up too many doors, I think, in terms of finances. Um, that would be my concern, no, I, uh, I to give them the flexibility within that professional salaries line. What do you Still, mean each line? Like, uh, I think professional, is it, don't we have a separate line for teachers and one for administrators, counselors, that? Like, is, are they the same or are they different? I think, I think what Mr. Koss is talking about is not to go over what you spent last year. Basically right. to replace them. But I, but I wouldn't be in, I, I, my intent with the amendment wouldn't be to open it up for security, for maintenance, custodians. I'm talking teachers, paras, any of those type of guidance. Academic staff. Academic staff. That, yeah, I'm I just think saying it, it might bounce to different groups. That's and I'm not I saying, saying that, you know, you. not trying to shortchange custodian security. I just think that there's an opportunity there if there are needs to hire those individuals at a later date. Whereas if you're looking for, you know, staff that are credentialed, certified, et cetera, et cetera. Those, when we say that educational pool's gonna, staff. I'm sorry? Only educational staff. Right, right. I make okay. that in a form so of a, a amendment a to the motion. Second. I got a motion, I got an amendment, I got an amended motion Second. from Mr. Uh, Aguiar. Any further discussion on that? On the amended motion, Deb? Or do Mr. we have to do the amendment first? No, yeah, because if the uh, amendment doesn't carry, it reverts back. Just a point of order. If the amendment doesn't carry, Mr. Mayor, what will happen to go back to the original motion, right. which okay. I don't know if we've got a All second. Right, so the, the amended motion of Mr. Aguiar is amended by Mr. Costa. Deb, go ahead, buddy. Mr. Aguiar? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Next item Now up. on the motion. I think we had to approve the amendment, now the whole motion. Well, the motion with the amendment carries. It would only revert back to the main motion, which I think was less. As long as it's done, that's all I'm worried about. <laughs> it is done. Yeah. Yeah, if, if, <laughs> just by way of information, if the amended motion would have failed, you're right, we would have been back to the original motion without right. the amendment, but it Next carried. Next 11.4. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion on the conversion at Adam Talbot? Hearing none, Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Aguiar? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Mr. Chairman, if I can just ask, if you could just read what that item was, just for the public the edification. conversion of a 1.0 instructional support liaison and a 1.0 ESL paraprofessional to a 1.0 ESL teacher at the Talbot Middle School, as presented by Dr. Matthew Malone. Thank okay. you. Next item on the agenda. The conversion. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item up on the agenda, 11.5. Discussion and vote to approve the usage of the Durfee High School parking lot to hold the Fall River Drive. So moved. Second. As presented by Mr. Ken Pacheco. Any discussion on the drive-in? Mimi. I think this is a great thing to come up with, City. I love the uh, interns you have working on it. And uh, kudos to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Tommy? Chairman, I want to I want to second that. Um, those of us who care about children um, is really reflected in this motion to have a drive-in movie night, and uh, I think it's great for the community. Good work, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anything and for also, it? oh, good, Ms. Costa. I, I would just add that it also emphasizes the importance of the census. I, I, the backdrop to the movie is is. The census and, and how important that is, not just for educational funding, but for funding for all municipal services. Um, without accurate numbers, um, we don't receive the adequate funding from the federal government um, that reflects the population that we're actually out there trying to serve. So 
I, I think it's important that we do, and I, and I like the idea of combining the two, but I think you know, we all as elected officials and members of this community should really be pushing the emphasis of, of the importance of completing the census. You can do it online. Um, I did it during one of the first weeks that COVID struck and everybody was homebound. It's, it's rather uh, an easy process to go through, um, but I like the idea of partnering the movie with um, getting the message out about the importance of the 2020 census. With that, I yield. Okay, so the movie is Toy Story 4, Saturday night at um, Turfey High School. It's five dollars a carload, and we'll give you some free snacks. What time does Jaws on? start? <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mimi. Could we please have? A, hope we see you there. Deb, roll call, please. Mr. Agnew. Yes. Mr. Costa. Yes. Mr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Corey. Absolutely. Miss Larravee. Yes. Mayor Coogan. Yes. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is a discussion and vote to prove, approve the installation of a marker and planting of a tree at the Resiliency Preparatory Academy, along with the establishment of an annual recognition award in memory of Robert Medeiros. Motion to approve. And second. Um, Robert was a longtime custodian in the Farver Public Schools, um, who passed away recently, and this is a very fitting tribute. Mr. I have Chairman a motion to second, Mr. Costa. On the motion, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to obviously ask uh, for the committee support this evening. Um, uh, Mr. Medeiros obviously, you know, is well known to probably everybody around this table, uh, whether your kids refer to him as Mr. Bob um, or you, you may have, um, but I, you know, obviously Mr. Medeiros was a personal friend to a lot of us here on this committee, um, long serving, um, public servant within the city of Fall River, um, 38 years, I believe, or just short of 38 years of service um, to city of Fall River and um, did his job outstandingly. Um, I, I never ran into a, a principal or a staff member who ever had um, anything negative to say about Mr. Medeiros. Um, whether you saw him out front of RPA um, sweeping the curbs in the morning before students came in or um, when he was at Spencer Board, and uh, he was just someone who was always there and always around. Um, this came of uh, a group of, they call it the Thursday night crew, um, myself included, um, would socialize on Thursday night, and, and Mr. Medeiros was a, a part of that. Um, they were trying to come up with something uh, to sort of recognize, you know, his years of service, and uh, there were a couple of things that went back and forth, but the group decided that they wanted to um, privately fund uh, the tree and the, and the installation and the plaque uh, honoring Mr. Madeira. So this won't come in as a, as a cost to, um, to the district if, if there are individuals out there who are wondering that. Um, in addition to that, I had proposed the idea, and, and I'm asking for the committee support tonight on it, that um, in addition to that memorial that will be there for Mr. Madeira and for the students who come through the doors at RPA, but also that I know the superintendent awards his golden apple um, to uh, educators uh, throughout the district. I'm asking that there be a, an established recognition award in memory of uh, Mr. Robert Medeiros given annually to um, someone either in a custodian role or in a maintenance um, role so that each year annually um, an individual can be recognized for their stellar uh, work and dedication and commitment to the district um, in his uh, name. So. Um, I ask for the committee support. Um, typically, this is something that may be referred to a subcommittee. However, I think given um, the schedule uh, and the need to, I believe, get the tree in the ground, um, we are up against it time-wise, and, and I wouldn't want to delay this, but um, I'd ask for everyone's consideration uh, on this tonight. With that, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank Corey? You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I was uh, really pleased <laughs> to see uh, the idea come up, and uh, I want to fully support you on this motion. I had the opportunity to work with Bob Medeiros in many different situations, and, and I found him to be such a shining example of being a great human being, and uh, somebody who was very, very happy in his role and how he radiated that. It, it had positive effects on everybody in the building, the students especially, who loved him as Mr. Bob. 
And so uh, I couldn't be more pleased uh, to support this motion in the memory of Bob Medeiros. May you rest <coughs> in peace. Anything further? I got a motion and a second. Uh, Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agam? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Um, I have a number of retirements. Motion to accept them, please, on file. Second it. Uh, retirements, resignations, and appointments. Um, I have a motion and a second. You want to call the roll, Deb? Mr. Agam? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hatza? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Uh, new business, number 13. Um, and, and, and there is no any new business to come before the committee? Hearing none. No. May I just ask one thing? Oh, go ahead, Mr. Uh, I appreciate uh, what you guys took a vote on tonight with Mr. Medeiros. If possible, if the committee wrote up a description of why this award is so important, I'd love to be able to read that at one of the two times a year we do awards, awards recognition so. in front of the to come from the committee and, and the honor that like, <clears throat> this person wins this award, this award is, and then we could have it every year to someone as you guys took the vote on, whether someone's in custodian or maintenance. That would be pretty cool. So I just want to say, yeah, we miss uh, Mr. Medeiros, Mr. Bob, and uh, we look forward to uh, honoring and recognizing uh, <clears throat> him and his service uh, in perpetuity moving forward. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mimi. Just quickly to hop on the recognition uh, aspect, just want to say congratulations to the Durfee 2020 seniors and the RPA 2020 seniors. We're all very proud of you, and congratulations. Tomorrow's going to be a great day. I'm uh, very happy that our district was able to pull this off and have an in-person graduation for our students. Uh, that's all. Congratulations. <clears throat> okay, Coogan. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Hart? Just something real quick. Um, uh, it has nothing to do with really any new business. Just uh, tomorrow, I believe, maybe the superintendent can correct me, uh, that MIAA is going to meet tomorrow um, and determine whether there's going to be any um, fall sports. Is that correct? Was... So, well, they're going to meet tomorrow. To, it's likely they're going to be pushing the start date back. So originally right now, it was fall sports were to start on August 21st. There's now talk that perhaps they'd take a vote and it would be September 14th, but again, t TBD. Uh, if you read, I tweeted out today, I read the uh, <coughs> article by uh, Danny Ventura from the Herald. Right, exactly. That, that yep. also says that some sports may come back and others won't. Now, so, will you know the decision to, <clears throat> they, will yeah, you whatever, know for, could you get it to uh, as soon as, the members? Yeah, as soon as okay. uh, the, M the MIA, usually what they do is uh, they email out the association members right after and then I'd forward it to you so everyone knows uh, where we are, you know, our, our athletics uh, and sports programs are uh, preparing for some sort of activities in the fall. We just don't know what they're going to look like yet. And when we're told, we'll be ready to respond. No, I, I think that it's going to be a big decision tomorrow. And, um, you know, it's going to affect, the, of course, all the scholastic students. And I hope, I, I understand that they might extend it uh, to, like you said, September or October. But um, I really hope that they uh, come to some positive uh, determination for our students. So with that, I, I, I yield, Mr. Mayor. Okay, anything further? Item number 14, request for executive session. Mr. Assad, do we have any reason to go into executive session? There would, uh, Mr. Chair. At your direction, I could read them off. Please. Okay. First, Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 21A7, to review and approve executive session committee minutes for the June 8th 2020 regular meeting of the Forward School Committee. Also, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, 21A7, <coughs> to review and approve executive session committee minutes for the June 24, 2020 <coughs> special meeting of the Forward School <coughs> Committee. Also, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to pro, uh, potential litigation relative to the transportation contracts with Trembley Bus, in out District 7D van transportation. Amaral Bus, Typical Education, Yellow Buses, and Wailing City, In-District Special Education Bus, Summer Bus Transportation, and Bus Monitors, as the Chair has determined an, a, an, exec, an open session may have a detrimental impact on the litigation position of the committee. 
May Act General Laws, Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all cafeteria employees of the Forever School System represented by the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 93, Local 1118, as the Chair is determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. May Act General Laws, Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all maintenance employees of the Forever School System represented by the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 93, Local 1118, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on a bargaining position of the committee. National Law Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all custodial employees of the Florida School System, represented by the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 93, Local 1118, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on a bargaining position of the committee. <laughs> National Laws Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all safety, security employees of the Forever School System, represented by the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 90, Council 93, Local 1118, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on a bargaining position of the committee. National Laws Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all civil service clerical employees of the Forward School System, represented by the Forward Department of Civil Service Clerical Empl Associate Employees Association, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on a bargaining <coughs> position of the committee. National Laws Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all professional employees of the Fulver School System, represented by the Fulver Federation of Paraprofessionals, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Uh, National Law Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all government program employees, including without limitation, paraprofessionals, parent workers, and clerks of the Fulver School System that are paid from federal and state grants and represented by the Fulver Public Schools government programs as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. National Law Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all administrators and employees represented by the Fall River Administrators Association as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. National Law Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all professional teaching employees of the Forever School System, including coaches, Title I teachers, nurses, occupational and physical therapists, and specialists in the teaching profession, represented by the Forever Educators Association, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. National Law Chapter 38, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and or to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel, including Chyla Johnson Ale, Instructional Support Liaison, Edward Gomes, Administrative Intern, Derek George, Administrative Intern, John Fernandes, Junior Tech Support Technician, Darren McGann, Junior Tech Support uh, Technician, Tamir Guselek, Junior Tech Support Technician, and Paula Saws, Executive Ad Administrative Assistant, to the superintendent. We will reconvene. There may or may not be statements at that time. Motion for executive session. Second. I get a roll call, Deb, please. Mr. Agna? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hutzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Recess. Roll. Let's go. Mr. Agia? Here. Mr. Costa? Here. Mr. Harp? Here. Mr. Hutzel? Here. Mr. Corey? Here. Ms. Larravee? Here. Mayor Coogan? Here. Do we have anything coming out of executive session? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead there, Mr. Costa. I'm going to make a motion to approve the executive session minutes for... June 8th, 2020, of the regular meeting of the Forest School Committee. Second. <laughs> Any discussion on the approval of the minutes? 
Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agio? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the executive session committee minutes for June 24th, 2020, special meeting of the Forest School Committee. Seconded. Any discussion? Deb, go ahead. Mr. Agio? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Mr. Costa? I'd like to make a motion to approve the contracts as negotiated with Shyla Johnson Alley, Instructional Support Liaison. Proof. Second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the contracts as negotiated with Edward Gomes, administrative intern, as negotiated. Second. Discussion? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the contract as negotiated with Derek George, administrative intern. Second. I have a motion and second. Any discussion? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the contract as negotiated with John Fernandes, junior tech support technician. Second. Any discussion? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. I'd like to approve the, uh, make a motion to approve the contract as negotiated with Darren McGann, junior tech support technician. Second. Any discussion? Deb, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. To make a motion to approve the contract as negotiated with Mr. Tamor Guzelik, junior tech support, support technician. Second. Any discussion? Deb, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzler? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Motion to approve the contract as negotiated with Paula Soares, Executive Administrative Assistant to the Superintendent. Any discussion? Deb, please. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hawk? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Motion to adjourn. Second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Hetzel? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Bam!